and welcome to another episode of More Than Dice. I'm Gonzo. I am still not Kathy, though I have applied for membership. <laughs> uh, we do have uh, fake Kathy in our picture today, our, our, our Kathy Birdie pose. Uh, John has taken the night off. He is going to take a break and do some chilling and relaxing. Um, but So you get Jim and I uh, today. Um, today we're going to be talking about painting earth tones and, uh, some very cool news coming out of Gen Con, uh, that Jim is very happy and excited about. Um, and Jim is prepping his last model for the show tonight, getting that oil on there. So other than that, let's go and get to our business. We want to thank Turbo Dork, our cool sponsor. Um, we will be doing another $50 gift certificate, uh, from them pretty soon. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we want to thank Midnight Heroes. Um, they are actually going to be not only the sponsor of us, they will be at Warfare Weekend. By the way, Turbo Dork will also um, demoing, but he is definitely going to be at ReaperCon, so don't forget to go if you're going to go to ReaperCon, say hi to them. Tell them that you heard about us on uh, heard, heard about Midnight Heroes on Warfare Weekend and More Than Dice. Um, Mini Masterworks. Uh, don't forget we have a code for them. You can get a discount. On anything you buy there, I know that we got quite a bit of people that bought the um, paint shakers uh, type thing. Uh, we want to thank Muse on Minis. Um, by the way, keep an eye on Muse on Minis uh, podcast section. They are doing an update. It is not ready yet uh, for their thing, but they are getting that ready. I don't know when, so you'll have to like catch our stream some other way <clears throat> on the music. Let me see if he's got it up yet. Nope page is still not up i know that they're re they're redesigning their podcast uh area um we also want to thank parabellum war games where you also get a nice little diff, nifty little discount code from them um using our affiliate link which then does of course give us a little bit of kickback when you buy stuff um and they did debut their um first blood 2.0 rules um pretty heavily at gen con and i think that went pretty well um, I think I got everybody. I think so. So other than that, um, I don't have any shout outs this week. Do you have any shout outs, Jim? I do not. I don't either. I haven't found any. I didn't think we needed to do anything, but we'll just have to go with it. Um, other than that, um, let's get back to the really, really, really important questions. Jim, what are you drinking tonight? This time, it's a little bit different. It is rum and Coke. This time, as opposed to rum and ginger ale. <laughs> it's rum and Coke, uh, which uh, I'm sure you're making Captain Mizzy a little uh, jealous with that. Because um, that's her shtick of all things. Um, I get to do the lovely, lovely water again today. Um, one, our city is under a boil. Um uh, order so we can't use any water from the sink or refrigerator so we went out and bought a bunch of bottled water to use uh also i finally got over using all of my meds and stuff for my um bacterial infection i got and now my allergies are kicking up so i'm like great it's like one thing leads into another so now my allergies are acting crazy so i'm gonna be nursing this water for a bit because I had to take some medication and I don't mix medication with alcohol no matter what it it is type thing so that's what I'm gonna be drinking guys we appreciate you coming on we appreciate you hanging out with us we appreciate you listening to any formats that we have whether it's on Spotify iTunes Muse on Minis our SoundCloud wherever we appreciate it uh, we also want you to know that we have three podcasts networks under us of course you know the minority report mm -hmm. um they have uh, they're underneath us and always and i want to say underneath us they're just on the network uh always bringing you really good information uh about war machine and hordes uh we have the tried and true podcast which is a delaware war machine and hordes group and they did a just recently did a huge huge interview of privateer press employees uh which was a really good uh series um, and then just recently, uh, Seth Cohen of the Boker Brawl and his Boker Brawl podcast is now um, on the More Than Dice area. And we host his files and put it out there for everybody to listen to. Hey, Xander. 
Um, and so you'll have that. Um, rumor we may get a couple of more, which would be kind of cool. Um, you know us. If you got a podcast you think uh, would fit well with us, uh, let us know. We, uh, we're super cheap. We just all share the hosting fee, which is like $15. <laughs> I think it's now $3.75 that we all pay each because <laughs> there's so many of us. So, I mean, it's just going to keep going down and down the more people get. And we just host it and put it all up there. Um, so, with that said, guys, we appreciate you. We appreciate everything you do uh, coming out, hanging out. Uh, I'm going to hold off on the uh, the door prize, I guess you could say, until – thank you, Xander. I'll put my ears on right after this cheer. Um, and we'll do, we'll do the grab bag next week when John is here so we can all kind of have a good time. So, other than that, cheers, everyone. Cheers. All right, let me get my ears on. Xander had to do it. He's taking up the slack for everybody else that's not here tonight. Because everybody's coming back from Gen Con. Yes, we did. Last week. Um, I'm going to go give this on the paint can. That one stuff big and bright. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. I'm trying to get over to allergies. Um, Jim, so while you're still prepping these minis and they're getting ready for your uh, earth tones, why don't you tell everybody about the cool news that you heard out of Gen Con? You know, I think this is maybe Sigma or 40K. It wouldn't be the biggest news ever, but for, <laughs> but for Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game... This is pretty colossal. It's not the number of miniatures. It's actually kind of the fact they're doing this at all. They actually are, they've created another starter box, and it's going to be sort of Askelia themed. So you'll have the rule book in there. You're going to have the tokens. There will be some new heroes, but there's also some new terrain. And this is something that slowly they've been adding in. They've done the Rohan buildings. They did the Dogul Door stuff. Now you have some actual new. And actually, it's kind of nice as Gilead terrain because it's got multiple floors, whereas the original stuff was literally just one floor. So that looks kind of nice. As far as the heroes go, I, I don't believe these are plastic kits. Something tells me these are all going to be Forge World kits, but you got yourself a Glorfindel, you got Elrond, and, and those kind of needed some updates. Uh, they definitely did. Uh, Elrond now, definitely did because I, I had him in a set and it was it was a bad model it, it was, wasn't very good because they i think it was maybe several years ago forge world did one even that is not eh, it's not so fantastic there's some new galadrum stuff uh, i don't know if they really needed to do that this is a as far as growing the game this is another thing players are excited about if you're a long-term player i mean maybe you pick one of these up but they're called they're called battle boxes i believe or battle hosts and there's four of them right now. So you got a Rohan, a Mordor, a Minas Tirith, and an Isengard. There is a lot of older stuff in these boxes. But the fact that they made the boxes, that's kind of the important thing. Because clearly the idea here is to grow the game. Is to get people, new people, to buy these boxes. Sort of like mini starter sets. I guess they, you know other games did the same thing. So just pe taking a peek at some of the uh, Skillia style terrain. Uh, again, I think it's a step above the old stuff. And I think it's probably going to be more interchangeable, whereas the old terrain, there was one way to build it. Everything they've done with the Rohan stuff and the Dogal Door, there's multiple ways to put this terrain together. You also have a new Gothmog foot and mounted. And when I looked at this new one compared to the old one, uh, it, it's been a while since I've seen you know, Return of the King. These are definitely a little bit more close to the Return of the King movie type version so i think those should be really nifty the other thing i'm excited about is a new well some rangers of athelion you got faramir madril and damrod that's because we were just talking about the old elrond figure maybe not being quite so nifty yeah these these are way niftier i mean that they, they actually look like faramir i mean the old one was kind of like oh look it's some random dude with long hair possibly a beard and he has a cloak might be faramir he could be george or ken i don't know but these guys actually look like the people they're supposed to. And again, my guess is they're all going to be Forge World. 
So this is going to be interesting, this Battle of Osgiliath. My my assumption is you'll have Gothmog and Faramir in there. Now, if they're in that box, that could mean they are plastic. So the Gothmog kit could be plastic. As, as I look at this and I see Faramir's face on the cover of that box, I'm thinking, hmm, price point, they didn't say. No price point on any of these things. But just the fact that they've done this much at once with the defense of the north and all the Easterling stuff and the awnings that were just a couple of months ago. This is sort of like, this would be like three editions of 40 K coming out in a week. I mean, that's the scale of these releases compared to what they've done in the past. So that, that kind of has us really, really happy that they've done at least this much for us. Uh, there is, I, I don't think there's any changes to the rules. We were a little bit concerned you know, new starter box, whole new set of rules, and now everything that we've been getting over the last two and a half years becomes tainted. Looks like it's just the same rule book. So I think we're good there. Uh, the tokens kind of look the same, same, same little plastic rulers. The, as I see the miniatures out there, it's going to be some Moranin orcs, a troll chieftain. Uh, the same old Plastic Rangers and, uh, unfortunately, the same old Warriors of Minas Tirith. But, oh, no, I'm looking at this. Yeah, so that is the new Gothmog. And so you could be getting some Plastic Heroes. Wow. That would be fantastic because Forge World has improved somewhat from years ago when I last was working with it. But I, I would always take the Plastic Kits instead because I think they're just... You don't have to worry about air bubbles and other weird mold slip type things that can still happen with Forge World stuff. But I'm pretty sure all the El El the Elvish stuff, that's going to be Forge World. But, wow, well, I guess we are going to get ourselves some plastic hero kits. Wow. So sorry to be so excited about Lord of the Rings, but, you know, hey, th <laughs> this is the guy that was so delirious to finally get to paint a 20-year-old miniature. So this is the thing we did on the last stream. The last time you guys saw this, it was unpainted basing bits from Make It Epic. And this figure, it's obviously released around two towers. And this is the old metal Eowyn figure. 20 years, it was worth the wait because it had me some nifty basing bits. And again, this was, uh, you can check this out from last week where we wanted to have a playable figure, also a diorama. And I, I also painted this, uh, well, <laughs> Here, let's grab our Ammon Hen first. So we painted this one on stream as well. This is uh, one of our landscapes of Middle Earth. And after painting that, I said it's only appropriate to paint this old metal Aragorn figure. So there's Aragorn at Ammon Hen. Once he's dry, I'm going to put this uh, same kind of foliage on him. I'll be using some of the Green Stuff World tall foliage. Now there's a kind of a nice tan version of this. You can see how nice and tall that is. I thought it would really mirror some of this foliage really well. So I'm pretty darn excited about that. Again, the guy that gets really excited about ancient metal figures and then uh, a smattering of new stuff. I'm sure, uh, like, after the Warcry release of last week, people are like, eh, okay, that's news, but is it really that big? Again, if this is 40K or Sigmar, it's kind of like, eh, whatever. But <laughs> this is colossal when it comes to the game that we love that we love the most why do we love it because the rule system has stayed pretty much stable for 20 years and kind of hard to say that about some of the other systems that about every two years undergo such a radical change that the, the very table or gaming mat you had is no good anymore yeah there's uh there's something to say about games that don't change as much um i know that there was a big discussion about um, 40K recently about having to buy all the books and everything because um, somebody was talking about, you know, they need to start releasing rules for free. And that's just not the way GW does stuff because they've got their own printing company pretty much. And they, you know, that's how they make extra money to keep them going and so on and so forth. And someone was kind of ragging that... Um, <clears throat> that Privateer Press was going to be releasing the rules for free and it was going to be on the app, an app. And I'm like, I'm okay with that. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to buy anything. And he says, well, you know, you don't need as many books to play 40K. And a friend of mine jumped in and was like, um, I have a Space Marine player right here. 
he has to have seven books to play his army. And I was like, what? So. Funny you should mention that. This is the other thing that has us very intrigued as far as community growing or growing the game. And it piggybacks off of what you just said, which makes this much more magnified. Those battle host boxes, apparently there's going to be free profiles. Good. So with those, because obviously they want people to start playing this game. So as, as you mentioned that about 40K, and I'm sure it's the same way with Sigmar, for Games Workshop to do this, given what they do with 40K and the seven books that you need to play one faction, basically, yeah. this is pretty interesting that they've gone this route. So I don't know what it foretells, but interesting. That is interesting because, you know, GW's never free rules and free books is, you know, unheard of from them. So altruism is not part of the GW business model. <laughs> so it's interesting. I, I, I got into uh, Lord of the Rings at one point and was got into it. I played elves. I only got to play like, five games and then it died in the area it just didn't get popular and the people that bought into it quick playing it quickly and so i was like uh and so i sold it to somebody which elves were you playing uh, galadrum rivendell uh rivendell Second? okay i had elrond and i oh man i had i had a it, it was it was such a good list and you know we didn't I had piled everybody up into like a center, like large group at this little gathering that we played at. And all of a sudden everybody was right near uh, Elrond and then Elrond cast the knockdown spell of all the, the, the waterfall or whatever it was called. He has the, the big old nature's wrath, probably something yeah. like that. And it just knocked off the entire army down because he was so close. And I was like, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that doesn't work that way anymore. That's for sure. That's one of the things that's been uh, toned down just a wee bit. Um, what's interesting is that the way they've kind of expanded the game without having to drive everybody bonkers is with legendary legions. So there's the regular kind of Rivendell army that you would see just in the main rulebook, but there's also a few you got Merkwood Rangers and they're they're listed you can't necessarily build them many different ways because they're literally like Azog's Legion. You know, you have to have Azog. There's uh, other le like the Spider Queen and, and other type things. Now even the Hobbit Legendary Legion, if you're gonna do those, you must include this or that character. Sometimes it's not the best character to have, but they're they're trying to create a little bit more options as far as different armies but obviously with lord of the rings they can't create a new faction so it's almost like they would be a sub faction uh i don't know what you call them successor chapters for 40k or something like that so a, a way to be able to expand your lord of the rings armies without necessarily needing to buy a whole new army you, you know, if you already have Rivendell Elves, you have most of the Rivendell Legendary Legion. It's just there would be maybe a, a different version of Elrond. Uh, obviously, Halls of Thranduil, that's got your uh, Thranduil on the on the moose or on the elk or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, obviously, the, the Rangers are a little bit different. The Mirkwood Rangers as opposed to just a standard, say, Elf Ranger in the main rulebook. So it's nice that you can... It's almost as like you can have as many armies in Lord of the Rings as you could, say, in Sigmar or 40K now. Whereas before, you might have been able to do 12. Obviously, you could ally things, but now you could have four or five different Rivendell, straight-up Rivendell armies instead of Rivendell plus something else. Now, they created other movie-specific legendary legions like Defenders of Helm's Deep. So you're going to have... Not just Rohan, not just Galadrim elves, but some of the special characters like the kid, you know, the guy with the one eye that fired off the bow too early. So they, they try and include some actual character in that when they're doing something like a legendary legion. Sometimes there's a little power creep that sneaks into those. Just saying. But they usually actually correct those fairly quickly. Uh, I know they did that with the Vanquishers list. 
which which came out immediately everybody went oh my gosh what is this and within i think a matter of weeks they did an faq to uh, bring that back to reality <laughs> which hey i appreciate it i am not going to complain uh being responsive i guess you know a company that's not known for being responsive i'll i'll take it i won't complain and that this is a person that's always willing to bring out the beat stick on gw i'll say nope they've uh, they've gotten some things at least uh, right by us yeah i mean there's a there is a cult following pretty much to the lord of the rings game i mean there's not a lot of people that play it but the people that do play it are very passionate about it and and love it a lot and it, it's a, it's a good game i am not you know not dogging any any at all it's just very very few people play it and it's, and, it, and it's not supported as well as i think it should be it's so fun. that's why people want us to move to australia and new zealand cuz when there's a lord of the rings tournament you're talking 120 players this is like 40k style tournaments but for lord of the rings yeah and it's and the, when you see the terrain that they've done it's really amazing um uh, in the uk well I don't, I don't know should the uk really count i mean it's from essentially <laughs> from there so i think them having 120 player tournaments you would expect that but that far away and that kind of like articon it is a massive lord of the rings event all about middle earth strategy battle game and it's it's well i guess you know well where they filmed it would it be as popular there if the filming hadn't been done at new zealand maybe not i don't know but my goodness is it a big deal there i, I kind of wish it was more so here i i don't know what it would take now, obviously with war machine you're going to be talking about that they're trying to obviously with the new version kind of expand the community and take it into new places uh, make it a little bit more accessible to um, new models, um, new customizations, new rules, making the rules a bit easier uh, also, which is really good. And some people say you're dumbing down the game, and I'm like, no, they're making it accessible and just simplifying the rules and making it easier to do stuff. So, I mean, which has always been a, you know, a hard place for War Machine because it can be super complicated and super daunting for people to play now i was talking about these battle host boxes and, and it seemed like war machine or well war machine and hordes were the first ones to come out with what would you call them, playable starter armies where it was an affordable box was it you know the most expansive wide-ranging choice army no but you know if you wanted to get started with everblight you buy this box and you could start with Everblight or whatever. I, I, were they kind of the first ones to do something like that? Uh, I don't know. Um, but they did definitely do, you know, like here's a 50 point, you know, the boxes, which were really good for people starting out. Um, and it got people excited. But I mean, that was, that was a long, long time ago. And it didn't last very long because they were expensive, expensive to make. Um, but yeah, there was they they did that. They're doing it again with this new edition, and it's like you get the entire you get a fifty point army right off the bat, um, and you get two jacks, and those two jacks can be customized sixty four different ways because they give you all the arms and heads to do the combinations of whatever you need. So. It's gonna have it's gonna have some customizations, and they're gonna have cadre boxes that come out uh, that'll make it a little bit easier. That'll help fill out your list to like a seventy-five or a hundred point, uh, depending on what's going on. So yeah, they're doing that. Um, I know that a couple of other like GW does that, but you need more. Uh, from the way I understand, like I said, I don't play any GW games, but I know that. They've done starting boxes or get get starting, I think is what they're called, and they just you need like three of those or something because they're you're playing with so many models and so many points. I think, but don't quote me on that. I don't play GW games, so I just know I've seen a couple of that. And and Warcry is such a different animal. I know we talked about that last week. Yeah. Um, 
I think this is the third version, or is it the I think it's the third one because I just think of it in terms of the terrain and such. <laughs> and I think this is because it's very different from the previous terrain. The, the first two editions, the terrain was very, I don't want to say urban, but it was very much uh, architectural. This is obviously much more kind of a foresty swamp type of a thing or yeah. whatever. So a little bit different than the first two iterations. have no idea if there's any kind of rules changes coming up. Uh, they, the title of it was, you know, Big Changes Coming to War Cry. So I don't know, maybe they're having some more of those uh, scenario cards or mission cards. Uh, now, that's not something that they're trying to do with War Machine. Are they is a new type of scenarios or the scenarios kind of been the same from the get go? Um, they their their new steamroller packet will have new scenarios because the game is changing enough like. For example, I play Grimkin, and one of my lists has 63-plus models in it and the ability to make 2D3 models a turn. And that's just outrageous compared to, you know, typical. Now lists are going to be, at the same point value, are going to be half that size. So they're going to be changing up their scenarios and battle things differently, but they're doing a lot of different changes to the game too, so it's... It's a big. It's going to be a big shakeup. Um, customizable spells. So like your warcaster will come with like three spells, and then they have the ability to take two or three spells depending on the warcaster. Um, different, so you can kind of customize your spell list. Um, and then you're going to have these spell card, these cards called the rack, a deck of cards that use. You can use two cards a turn but you can only use the card once a game and they'll give you like oh this unit gets pathfinder or this unit gets you know magical weapons or you know something of that nature so it kind of you know lets you customize your army and also one of the things that with all the theme lists that kind of hurt i don't want to say hurt the game but it just kind of limited you that you didn't have if you didn't have the right army with the right tools and list chicken came out and you lost list chicken as they call it because your list wasn't didn't have that x ability you just lost the game and so they're trying to get rid of that type of mentality which is good would you say that this newest version because what i always got the sense of the last several years is that they were I don't want to say they were forgetting about the hobby aspect or maybe minimizing it. Do you think this new iteration is also to maybe kind of regenerate some hobby interest again in War Machine? Um, I don't know. Just for some... Hey, Big Jim. Um, for the simple fact that I think that the hobby aspect... I know that tables are going to be a bigger hobby aspect. Uh, because they're stressing 3D terrain, and they want people to play with 3D terrain, which is good because, you know, while the flat terrain is very good for tournament play, it's not very appealing to the eye, you know what I'm saying, when you're playing. And so they're trying to get that in there. Um, for the hobby aspect, I don't know. I think one thing that, you know, we, as a, as a convention, we've been talking about different ways that we can have the hobby, hobby aspect besides um, besides the painting competition. And I think we may do something similar to Adepticon where they do the armies on parade. Uh, and we may do the same thing and do like a prize for that eventually. That may be like something for next year. And since we have many multiple games, we would just do it for all the games that are there. That way everybody can make cool little boards and so on and so forth. We just got to figure out, you know, how and what we want to do. But that'll get, that'll get into the hobby aspect, you know, get some people excited to do some hobbying. Because I think that's always really cool to see people that have the really cool trays and, you know, things like that. I mean, our games for the most point don't have all of that. But you got to start somewhere. Because I know, well, Kathy and I, we had to judge so many army painting things at Adepticon over the years. And the things that we would always look for would be things like basing treatment. Did they do something interesting to give their army an extra little bit of theme by something with the bases? You know, does it mean they have to spend five hours just on one base? No. 
But as long as there's something besides just, I don't know, rocks and gravel or just a black painted piece of plastic, if, if they did something a little bit extra, uh, we would kind of really look towards things like that. We actually had a little bit of a list that we would kind of make for people, almost like the four pillars of army painting, you know, a unique theme, some kind of unique basing theme that kind of carries everything from one miniature to the next, maybe some kind of a some kind of a story behind it, something that won't take an extraordinary amount of time to put on each figure, but something that just makes it different from well, everybody else's army. Yeah. Um, they're not, they will, I don't think they'll ever put like a painting requirement for winning a tournament on something. They've always stressed, you know, that you should give a painting trophy out or a painting reward out for the best painted army, but it'll never be part of a tournament score. Uh, because that's just, you know, they want people to play the game. And if someone's got a better painted army, I don't think they should win over someone that, you know, doesn't paint as well. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love you, Jim, but you're a painting god, and if it came down to, you know, painting score, you would win, you know, hands down every single time, and it would just, you know, screw me over <laughs> well what's interesting typically we're, we're talking about that theme right the unique theme mm-hmm. what would you call them uh meta lists tend to be really boring really hard to make any kind of interesting visual theme for so typically things that have that unique painting aspect to them they tend to be the softy list that are really easy to crush with a meta list correct and what would happen to me in all the tournaments I would do is that I would uh, that the soft scores would put me up against one of the top line players. Yeah. So my first game was against somebody who was practically a professional tournament player. So that that would set me that would set me in my place right away. Yeah. <laughs> that would set me way way back because I would wonder why the heck am I at this table? What am I doing over here? Uh, the only other the only tournament that never happened at was a. Uh, bolt action tournament well it's actually the same guys ran it. it was the lord of the rings and they also did a bolt action soft scores were very important but they also emphasized these uh, basically secret missions special missions so you might have the they would have a variety of awards there was the best general so the guy that just got the most battle points yeah then they had the best overall which was everything sportsmanship painting your, your actual wins, losses, and all that kind of stuff. And then they, they kind of made sure that there was different amount of awards. So no one person, like the guy with the beat stick list, wasn't going to automatically win. Or the guy that could usually rack up good soft scores was also going to automatically win. Uh, that system took a heck of a lot of work, which is why they don't run tournaments anymore. It was just too darn much work for them. Yeah. Now, I, I, I think you should give, you know, first, second, and third of the tournament. I always think that's a good thing to do, first, second, and third of the tournament. You know, a prize for them. I also think you should give, you know, a, um, you know, best painted uh, trophy, best painted army. Because those people put effort into it. You know, you, you, you should reward them. I don't think it should be, I don't think you should give that, I don't think that should be figured into whoever wins the overall tournament, in my opinion. Um, but I do think that you should recognize people that have fully painted armies or, you know, stuff like that. Cause that's part of the hobby too. What's interesting is that, uh, at these turn, the Lord of the Rings one and the bolt action one run by these guys winning the best painted thing. It was a challenge because oh yeah, the, the nature of the people that went to this, these were folks that not only loved the game, but loved the miniatures too. And it's, a, it's the nature of the system, right? The, the bigger system you get to, uh, there might be less emphasis, right? Uh, and that's really more the competitive aspect, which is fine. No problem. I mean, look, I would love to go to a Lord of the Rings tournament to blow up the meta. I just would love to show up with a horde of Easterling cavalry and to see people soil themselves because they've never seen more than two horses on a battlefield at once. <laughs> because the meta says... Only leaders on horses, everybody else on foot. As many guys on foot as you can get. And I just keep looking at this going, A, boring as all heck. I don't want to watch this anymore. But 
what if someone shows up with some? Well, that happened at that uh, bolt action tournament. I, I showed up with a Volshamiga list that didn't go attack people. They had no idea what to do because they were expecting something. I served up something entirely different. I won no games, yet I was playing at table two in a 40 player tournament. And actually, well, I don't think I ever I could have gotten best overall because I think the guy that won best overall, he just had, he was too far ahead of me with points. But there was actually a chance for me in that last game to at least get maybe as high as second, if not maybe third. So that was that was the way they had done that tournament. It was, again, emphasizing not just it wasn't about tabling your opponent. There was a there was, I think, six missions to choose from and there were five games. So you couldn't customize it to every single game. So there were some games where you were you were up against it just because of the secret mission to try and get those extra five points. And I was always accomplishing my secret mission because there was really no way I could do the main thing with such a tiny force. And people had no idea why I was playing the way I was. The rest of them totally forgot about the secret mission. So they were basically just pissing away five points every single game. Yeah. And Bolt Action is a game that just by its very design, half the time it's going to be a draw. And if you have two decent players that kind of know the game and each other, it could be even more than that. 60% of the time it could be a draw, which is why they created the special missions. So I just kept getting draws, and which is kind of, again, par for the course with that particular system. And then I would do the secret mission. I don't know if that's also something that the War Machine tournaments will tack on. Like the TO will say, okay, in addition to the normal scenario, here's ways to get yourself some extra points. No, I don't think they'll do that. Not in the official tournament formats, just because there's so much to the format to begin with. They'll just leave it as it is. Um, I know that Conquest does that. Uh, Conquest has secret, you know, missions in the the thing. So that that's in there, which, um, you know, if you like regimental battle games, that's going to be, that should be your shit right now because they're, they're amazing. Oh, um, guess, guess what showed up this week? Uh, Those three missing Conquest boxes. Nice. They are here. Thank goodness. And I will obviously try to prep some of that to paint on, on a podcast here. Sweet. Because I am really looking forward to it. I believe two of the three boxes were 100 Kingdoms, right? That's the older one. Uh, and I think there was a kind of the, the Paladins, and then there was sort of a Men at Arms, both mounted. And then the, what is it, not the Ordun? Who are the the orcs on the feathered pterodactyls? That's, that's Wadrun. Wadrun, okay. Yeah. So I think there's a box of those. So I'll try to maybe have a, Don't like some Kathy of see those. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I was kind of hoping that I could even get it to send some more things, but I do have that special character miniature as well. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. I've never painted any conquest stuff. I've never even assembled it yet. Oh, you'll like it. it it's good stuff. So I am really, really looking forward to it. Uh, I like the fact that I don't know if it's bigger than song of ice and fire. Oh yeah, it is. So would you say five, 10% bigger? Oh, much bigger than that, in my opinion. So I'm, they're, I'm looking they're pretty forward solid. To... They're pretty. They're huge models. Uh, I think there will be some chance uh, potentially for some some freehand. I also told him that I'd try to arrange for some way to have some object source lighting on some of the miniatures too. So I am really, I'm just super chuffed about that. Yeah, so happy to see those. They're they're huge models. You'll be real surprised. You'll you'll enjoy it. They'll be definitely, especially if you got Hundred Kingdom stuff, with all the heraldry you could do on them. So yeah. Oh yeah. Mm hmm. You'll, you'll yes, like indeed. So we'll definitely have to pick something special that we can do on a, on a podcast with those guys. I'm thinking I'm I'm gonna try and do a kind of a special basing video, since they're sort of Song of Ice and hey, Fire. Hey Sarge, thanks Hello. for the bit. Hey Sarge. Uh, because it's sort of like Song of Ice and Fire, right? You can play them as skirmish style, you know, just individual, or you put them on the movement trays. Correct. They, so, uh, First Blood is their skirmish version of the game, and then Last Argument of King is their uh, regiment battle game. So, 
I think I had asked a while back, is there any decent YouTube channel for, well, battle reports of any kind, but also more instructional battle reports where they um, kind of yeah. kind of show you how to play the actual game? Yeah, uh, play on tabletop. Um, they are the best ones that I can do. They do really well. They're, they're nice and slow. They don't play like super fast. And they talk about everything as they do it and how they do it and so on and so forth. But it's not like, you know, I'm rolling, you're rolling, I'm rolling, you're rolling. Uh, they also get into it and they have a lot of fun with it too. So, and they talk about it and discuss the rules as they play. And they're, they're very interesting to listen to. They're very nice. Ah, very that, fun. that's, that's really good. Cause that, that's how I learned bolt action. I had never played against another person and I did two tournaments playing playing a uh, bolt action based on the tabletop battle uh Svein and uh anders those two idiots just watching their battle reports they were so <laughs> instructional yeah you like them go, okay good they would go through all the modifiers and the whys and the wherefores and i really liked it they would, they would literally stop they'd say look don't roll the dice yet you know distance cover hard cover let's let's do all of the factors that are involved in this role let's just not start chucking dice and say hit or not because that's not really going to tell people so they really uh, that was great to grow the game i had hoped there would be more of that for armada the, there was a few folks that did that for the uh and actually i have the new fleet what the heck is, oh yeah that's the other thing is they sent me the northern alliance fleet so uh, from mantic here so i've got uh a collection of mid, small, and large size ships. So I'm going to try and get those prepped up for also painting up on stream. Because, you know, we used to have Armada Mondays on stream all the time. So hopefully we can get those guys assembled. Uh, Mantic also was going to be sending me, I guess it's not as new as it was at Adepticon, but the Halfling Army. Oh, yeah. I mean, halflings, right? I mean, it's... <laughs> There's so many comical things you could potentially do with those guys. I mean, why not? Uh, more hobbits is more better. So I think that would be very fun to paint up on stream and stuff. So I don't know if you've actually seen any of those up close and personal or not. What um? So we we've kind of we kind of went off on a tangent for a bit. Sorry, uh, it's okay. Uh, I can I can see that you're starting to paint some um, Ertos. You want to go ahead and start talking about that? I was just trying to get a little bit of a, you know, I like to have kind of a different stages type of a thing. Yeah. So this right here, I just wanted to show that everything that we painted on this one, it's all earth tones, whether it's the skin tones, the shoe or boots, the fur, the outfit, the spear, but it all starts very simply here. And these are obviously with my oils, a very simple pre-glaze of just some Van Dyke Brown, maybe a little bit of burnt umber here and there. That's it. We wiped it away with a sponge. But you can see, what, like 20 minutes with some lighter colors, boom, look what you got. You know, you're doing a whole unit of 12 spear wives. This is the way to get her done right quick. Now, when people think of earth tones, they think of just, well, brown. But there's a little more to it. So we're going to take the same color. This is Burn Dumber. Both of these paints are pigment brown number seven. But look at the difference. Now, are both of these showing up on camera here? Yeah, uh, take them to the left a little bit, or like it, uh, rotate it because the the right side of it has got a a, a shine on it. That a little bit better, because yeah, this is white over here. Okay, so that's white. So you can see this one right here. It's uh, look at this. It's more neutral. You'd mm -hmm. almost think that they mix black in there. You see how kind of reddish orange this one is. This is two different brands of paint, but yet you would con they're both considered burnt dumber. So when you say earth tones, what are you talking about? Straight up brown. Brown is made up of red and green, which means it's made up of red, yellow, and blue. Because yellow and blue make green. So you got all these colors in brown. Brown is like the most simple color everywhere, anywhere, right? Here's another example. Look at all these different browns. That's a very orangey red brown. This is almost yellow. That would be considered an earth tone. You've got this almost like a grayish brown. Same thing over here. These are all different color browns. Even this, that's a brown. That's a whole different color brown. You'd say that this one's more like this burnt umber right here. Very neutral. I got a whole bunch of color charts here that I want to show you. So here's another 
couple of different browns. Obviously, this brown has more yellow in it. This brown clearly has a little bit more blue in it because you can see how neutral it is. So both of these considered brown but still very different. Now you start mixing them with other colors. Well, now look at this. This is almost like an interesting kind of nurgly brown right here. We added a very bright yellow, added a pale yellow to it. It's almost like gray. This could be interesting for sort of a undead skin tone maybe or maybe mixing it with green. Here's some another example of some browns again. Depends what – this is just the same burnt umber. This is really the same – these six pieces right here are all the same color mixed with a few different yellows. The color you mix with it – and it doesn't matter whether it's oils or acrylics. It's irrelevant. You're going to be able to make yourself a lot of different browns. Here we got some more. There's another one right here. So again, we've got kind of a new, more uh, neutral brown there, very orangey brown. But you cut it with some other colors. This You would say that's yellow, but yet that's still technically an earth tone. Same with this over here. So as I start to paint this, well, let's look at this lady that we were just working on now. Where did she go? Here she is. So again, you've got more of a reddish brown right here. I was actually taking, oh gosh, you can't see my palette. I'll show you the color though. Here's the actual paint tube. I kid you not. This color right here is this, it's the same base as this one. This one, I mixed a bright yellow with it. This, I mixed this bright green. You, when you would look at this miniature, nobody's going to look at it and say, wow, look at the green you put on her pants. No, they're going to look at that and say, well, that's kind of a grayish brown. There's acrylic stuff like this too. So instead of just going, you know, snake bite leather with a slightly lighter color and then a slightly lighter color, or starting out with, I don't know, wild wood contrast paint and then go on to the next lighter thing, maybe take some kind of a weird light green color, mix it with that contrast wild wood. You might get some really interesting colors out of it. So, and this here, you can see it's uh, I actually took, believe it or not, a light violet color. And that is right here. Yeah. The brown itself was the same exact brown. But I mixed it with this light violet color over here. And that made the sleeve look a little bit more grayish. This over here, I actually took, here you are. So this is just a light kind of a bluish color on the spear. So you could take. If this is contrast paint, you could take contrast wildwood and then maybe take different lighter colors like this, mix them together. You also don't need as many colors, right? You don't need 10 different shades of brown. You could just have that one shade of brown, mix in some of these lighter colors. People will look at that and say, man, how'd you get all those different colors? You said, I use like four paints. <laughs> Saves money, right? One contrast paint. A few, you know, lighter opaque colors. That's a heck of a lot more affordable than trying to find a dozen triads. I mean, when you're buying all of your paint in triplicates, that's going to get pricey. Oh yeah. Whether it's oils or acrylics, it doesn't matter. I I, I try to make it uh, as neutral as possible, like not just oil specific. Uh, but here again, we'll, we're gonna you know, we'll pick this one right here, so you can see we got lots of darks already in place. That was our pre glaze where we wiped some of this away. Now let's uh, maybe do the skin tone. And I've actually got some examples of skin tone over here. Ah, here we go. So this is also considered an earth tone. So Terra Rosa. It's basically iron oxide. This is the same color I use for rust on all of my vehicles. But as you can see, it makes a darn fine skin tone. And I think we got the miniature that went with this tutorial. There it is. So again, that's very simple. Terra Rosa mixed with a lighter yellow. And then in some places where I wanted a little bit of a magenta touch, well, I just threw in some red. This is literally three colors. That's it. That's all it took to make all those different skin tones. And that is definitely something that could be replicated in acrylics. Now, darker skin tone. This is already on our miniatures, this brown matter. Oh, look. Here is, we mixed it with violet. Remember that violet we used on the sleeve? Same combo here, makes a nice kind of a darker skin tone. But I think we're going to be after the lighter skin tone here. So let's grab this. Let's grab ourselves this brush here. 
So that same Terra Rosa, which, not kidding, rust, poof, there it is. That's that's Terra Rosa there, some rust on our BT-7. And that's going to do a little bit of the liner stuff here, and then we'll just kind of dry brush some of this over the top. And you could do this with the acrylics too. You're not going to get quite the blending that we get here, but still considered an earth tone. We could, oh, what the heck, we could throw it here on our little tree branch. We could throw it here on the spear shaft. And we'll change this up. We say, well, let's maybe uh, go with something that's got that, that greenish tone here. This is sort of a light green. I'm gonna mix it up with a reddish brown. Now it should just kind of have a, like a grayish green look. There we are. I'll let that go for now. Then we're going to think about the sleeve here. There's that, we're taking that violet. This is going to make a little different color of grayish brown. Again, if you're doing this with acrylics, you're not going to get the nifty blendy stuff like this. See that? Oh, look. That was one layer. You could paint like 10 layers of paint, starting up from your darkest layer and mixing a whole bunch of paint on your palette, or you could do that. Here, well, let's do it on this same sleeve. We're going to chuck this on here, take this brush. We're going to push that around. All of these are various earth tones. Let, let's say we want to give her some hair that's maybe a little more yellow to it. Hey, so Cookie. I'm going to take me some yellow here. We're going to mix this up. Let's give her a little different color here. Uh, sort of a, not not strawberry blonde, but what's the, uh, not Auburn, I guess Auburn maybe, that's sort of a tan color here, not quite blonde, not quite brunette, but somewhere in between. So now we've got kind of the start of maybe a little bit of a, here, let's uh, go with a, something more neutral here, a little bit of that pale yellow. Let's get her some highlights on the hair real quick like still an earth tone it's it started out as brown didn't it the face started out as brown we just varied the browns what was that first color chart that i showed you color chart that had a little more red to the brown one that had a little more green to the brown and that's it makes sense because how do you make brown you literally you mix green and red together that will make brown now, chocolate-covered raisins will also help you make brown, too, but that's a different <laughs> kind. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the painting version here. Yeah, so a little bit of a lighter skin tone. All I did was take that same Terra Rosa, which is an earth tone, mix a little bit more of our yellow with it. Now, let's see. We've got this over here. What do we want to do with this? Let me see if I can find myself a different brown we're going to take van dyke brown this is a very it's almost like black in a way so i'm just taking some straight up white here mixing it with that van dyke brown and that this is going to start turning basically gray so when people look at this they'll say oh yeah that's that's just gray I think way back in the day, does Fortress Gray still exist in the GW color color world? I have no clue. There was a warm gray that I used to really like. It was called Fortress Gray. That's basically what I made here. Gray for the rocks is not gray. It's actually brown and white. But to the eye, it looks like gray. This We have a bunch of essentially different grayish browns, violet, green, and then this is just white right here. So it kind of, this is the most neutral of all of the grays that we've thrown down. And I'm not going to worry about making that too light because we're going to be throwing snow all over the top of that. Also, too, how long have we been painting on this miniature? I don't know, 10 minutes, maybe? Yeah, pretty much. All right, we're talking about the blue on the spear, right? Let's do that. So it's already brown. Why would we want it to be brown towards the bottom? Well, non-metallic or what? true metallic wouldn't matter either way. So now we've got ourselves a bluish gray on the top side. That really dark Van Dyke brown, that's going to go on the bottom side. Should only take one or two brush strokes here. 
boom boom now one last little bit here we'll take some of that warmer grayish brown on the underside here so that's the reflected light on the underside of this here blade a little more perhaps now we'll take some white to kind of really hit the highlight on this thing pretty hard and that should be our spear and let me get some of that paint off of that brush Oof, there's our lightest light there. Same over here on this side. Boom. So, again, still brown. Still all of this based in earth tone. But we've got one, two, three, four, five, six different earth tones in less than 10 minutes. Did we use maybe what? Um, one, two, three, four, about seven colors. This is, We could pretty much do the entire army this way. You know, if you had a whole army of spearwives, which I guess you could. I, I don't think I've ever seen a song of ice and fire army entirely of just spearwives, but that would you could really again work your way through these really quick. Here, that's pretty much burnt umber, which again is that sort of a reddish brown color. We're letting them white just mix with that because this is oils and that pre glaze, which you see right here. We're just going to let that brush mix right into it. So now we have two very different looking spearwives. Obviously got a little bit more reddish brown there. There's the same green over there. Got our spears ready to go. Uh, here, let's maybe do something on this spear handle. I'm going to take that same burnt umber. Why don't we darken this down a little bit and get some separation with the hands. Because at first I thought... I th could swear that the spear wives actually were wearing some kind of mittens, but the first two poses that I've seen don't look like they're wearing mittens. Now that same reddish brown, whatever this part of her clothes are, we'll just hit that. Got to do something in here to kind of separate some stuff. How's about some of that yellow again? So this is uh, practically a yellow ochre right here. And we'll just, uh, whatever this is, some fur. Not sure what that's supposed to be, but whatever it is, we need it to be a little bit lighter. Of course, with the Song of Ice and Fire stuff, it's a trade-off. They're all assembled. No nothing to assemble. It's all one piece. But the mold lines, eh, well, they can be in weird places. <laughs> they can be in inconvenient places, and they can be a real bugger to get rid of. But uh, I just used the sanding sticks on them. Uh, now, I'm, I'm curious to see how those Conquest figures are going to go together. Uh, they go together really well. But they're, and, your, and, they're your standard, typical, you know, models uh, and, of sprue. The usual plastic glue works on those, right? Yeah. Because I know uh, there's been time, like Rubicon vehicles, you cannot use plastic glue on those. You must use regular super glue. Now, uh, it looks like that's, uh, I think Ken is actually at the door. Hopefully, uh, someone's going to answer that. Uh, if in the next few seconds here, I don't see somebody run by to get that. Um, let me see if I can uh, maybe stir somebody up here. I uh, still don't hear anybody coming to get the door. Uh, one, one second, I'll be right back. <laughs> All right, uh, no problem. Uh, we're going to go switch over to the media section while Jim goes answer his door. Because uh, it is our media section. So, here we go. Um, while Jim's going to handle his stuff, we are going to um, talk about quite a few things. I think I have like six different things to talk about. Uh, sorry about that. Did you get it? Um, I was able to wake them up and say, somebody's ringing the doorbell. Get to it, people. All right. Where are we? Oh, yeah. We're taking... Uh... That reddish back brown. I, I switched to the media section in case you were going to we'll switch it back over. Sorry. Well, okay. If you want to keep going with that, that's fine. No, we'll just go back because you're in the middle of trying to get something done. Uh, well, we'll shout out, as, a, as I catch my breath here, we'll shout out uh, Badger Airbrush. They were very generous. And uh, since I couldn't be in the Badger booth this year, he set up a little bit of a, a donation yep. fund for us. So we want to shout out Ken and say thank you so much. And obviously it would have been way more fun to be at the Badger booth and painting there and spraying people with the airbrush, using it like a, a little portable water cannon. 
but uh, we appreciate that. So here you can see this is a, it's not quite the same skin tone here. The Terra Rosa was more orangey, the brown matter, and you saw I held up both of those color charts. Here, let's reinforce this a bit. It might take me a little while to find both color charts, but give me a second here. So there's our Terra Rosa, and there's our brown matter. So this right here is the color that I just put on her tunic, whatever that is. This is the color combo that we used on her face. You can see uh, those both qualify as earth tones, but look at how massively different they are. And now you can kind of see on the miniature itself here. So this is one of my favorite leather type colors here is this brown matter and mix it with a little bit of white. I don't know what it is. There's just something about this as a leather color that's really nifty. But you don't have to just highlight it with white. I could have used the green. I could have used the violet. This also makes a really good, say, Mediterranean skin tone as opposed to this, which makes it more of your usual Caucasian skin tone, if you want to call it that. Yep. Something like that. So here we're going to get a little bit of the, a little bit more of a rosy look here, especially since it is winter time, and while well, that would cause your cheeks to be and your nose to be a little bit more red. And that's a, it's very simple, right? It's just a little bit of red added to our mix. Again, the inter interruption aside, this is not taking very long, is it? No. Not to, so right here. There's already a bunch of brown matter right there. All I'm going to do is this. Big old nasty brush stroke right there. Let me grab something to use as a blending brush here. Hopefully it's on camera, and we're just going to do a little tap, tap, tap. There you go. One layer. Hashtag no layers. That's our, <laughs> that's our favorite saying on, on stream, is hashtag no layers. Now, of course, less layers with oils, not a bad idea. It will dry faster. If that's important to you, for it to dry faster, it will do so if you're not piling that paint down there like I get a steam shovel. Less is more. More is way too much. Now, I see it's 8.04, so if you wanted to go to the media section, I know you got a lot to talk about. No, you're fine. Go ahead and go with this. I mean, I don't. I only have like five things to talk about. No, okay. Uh, come September 2nd, I, I may have some speaks when it, <laughs> when it comes to that. Uh, I'm hoping that it's good speaks, that it's, uh, there's not a lot of herpes being dealt out. It's more space herpes is bad, right? Yes. So we're... Hopefully it's minimal herps. Uh, I don't want to be doling out herps like they're chiclets. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that there's that it's all bueno and uh, mucho bueno, and there's no herpes that have to be dealt out for that. Yeah, they've got a lot writing on... Um, we can keep it on the screen so you can continue to work. They've got a lot writing on this series. I'm going to try to make this a little bit larger for people to see. So, I mean, they, they've they got quite a bit going on on this. It's going to be either they're going to do really, really good or really, really bad. And I have a feeling it's going to do really good, especially the way it's looked. It hasn't been, you know, I haven't seen anything that makes me, you know, leery of it, which I thought was interesting. Talking about the media section, there was, um, they've already renewed um, Wheel of Time for season three already. And we haven't even what? seen season two. And I'm like. Season one was not good. Not good at all. And I'm like, they're already greenlit season three, so it's either got to be really, really good or something's up. Well, uh, they're in the lead up to the Rings of Power. Uh, they've, they're already saying, well, you know, most shows don't get good till the third season, which has made people nervous. I don't know. I mean, that just, that just kind of makes me wonder. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I hope that that's not the logic for the uh, for the Rings of Power series as well. It's like, well, you know, we sucked it for two years on Wheel of Time, but boy, did we nail it in that third season. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to to already get it greenlit for season three. So I'm like, hmm. Oh, uh, boy, oh, boy. Well, because I, I didn't even know. I thought it was already like it was so uh, hated and so reviled, reviled that they weren't doing it. It was off the air already. That Wheel yeah. of Time series. Now it, 
they got renewed for season two, which I thought was, I, I was surprised about that too. And then season, they went ahead and gave them a season three. And I'm like, really? A season three? Before season two comes out? That's, you know, that's, that's a big ask. Uh, is it a matter of, uh, well, in politics, they would say lame duck. I have no clue. If they, they say, well, you know, we really have confidence in this. Look, it's already got a third season. Whereas if it wasn't, it might, you know, it'd be like the rats on the Titanic. And oh, it not, not being renewed would be a sinking ship that everybody would just jump off. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see because this is, this is weird. Because, like I said, it was not well received by anybody. But it, and even the fans of the show were just like, yeah, this is not good. Or fans of the book, I should say. So we'll have to wait and see. Um, so I'm going to talk about. Um, so I watched Uncharted. It was on Netflix this week. Uh, Uncharted is a movie based off the video game Uncharted, which, by the way, I think is an amazing video game series. If you've never played Uncharted, uh, 100% go get it. It is an amazing series to play uh nathan drake series and all that stuff is really really good love that series um enjoyed the shit out of it great great series great fun uh good stories um but this is a story of course the hollywood version of uncharted um and it was okay was it the video game not really was it Based on the video game? Not really. Did they just use the video game's name? Pretty much. Um, but it wasn't a bad show. Um, it, it was okay. It was pretty much, if you were to take National Treasure and or Indiana Jones and make it with a young people, it would be okay. Because it didn't fit... Uh, nothing wrong with Tom Holland, nothing wrong with his performance, but Nathan Drake was a much older person in the video game. Um, and all the other characters were much older in the video game, uh, much more mature. And so it just, it just felt really weird and very off. Um, I said no, no negative on his performance or anything. It just didn't fit. I did think it was funny that they did have a cameo of the guy that does Nathan Drake's voice in the video game, which I thought was very nice. Uh, very cool. Um, it does lead open to a sequel. Uh, right off the bat, it automatically talks about a sequel um, and shows a sequel, so it's not a big deal. Um, will they get a sequel? I don't know. It didn't do great in the box office, but it didn't do horrible either. So, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but it was okay. I mean, it was better than, you know, most stuff I'm watching on or seeing nowadays. So, I mean, not a bad thing. I just don't think it, you know, one, Nathan Drake is an older guy and it just kind of didn't fit. Everything was, you could see where everything was going anyway. Uh, wasn't a big surprise, but, you know. It gives me, I give it like mm, two space herpes. Um, it's it's a decent watch. It's just kind of a little bit of meh, but not too bad of a meh. So, I mean, I enjoyed it. I don't have a problem with it. Um, and it's free on their thing. Uh, was it better than a DC movie? It is better than a DC movie. I feel so far, so, so sorry for DC. I, I did say I had someone crack a pretty big joke that the largest uh director's cut unedited of a movie that never made the light of day uh is batwoman <laughs> and i'm like that ah, you know largest unedited director's cut movie is never see the light of day is batwoman and i feel so far so i feel so bad for that movie because all those people put all those hours into that work and did so much for that movie and tried so hard and that actress hopefully she got paid you know well I hope everybody got paid that it didn't, you know, they didn't wait and get right on, you know, release. Cause they said they're not going to release it ever, which, you know, eh, I, the word forever kind of goes crazy, but they were like, they don't want to stream it on 
HBO Max or anything. And I'm like, eh, you may get your money back if you put it on HBO Max. But you never know. Um, and maybe HBO Max will give them a good deal to release it after it's been edited and stuff. But I just, I feel bad for them. Yeah, they, and they could be using it as a write-off so they can just get their money back on it. But still, I feel sorry for those people because that's, that's a lot of work. Making a movie's hard. Especially an action movie. Hopefully everybody got paid appropriately. Um, so, um, Uncharted, give it about... Uh, a two, but a good two. Um, it was fun. Uh, a lot of people wanted to see Michael Keaton. <laughs> um, next one is an Amazon series called Paper Girls. Paper Girls is a show about a girl, a group of girls that deliver paper in the 80s by the old bicycle method and, you know, throwing it at the house. Um, and something happens to them and they time travel to the future. Um, and while they're time traveling, they find out that there's two groups of factions that are fighting each other. One trying to stop the future from happening and one wanting to keep the future the way it is. Um, it wasn't a bad series, uh, but the special effects were bad. It reminded me of old sci-fi made-for-TV movie. Uh, sci you know, special effects. It was just not good. Um, it, it just did not work in that aspect, which I thought was a bummer. Um, characters were okay. It, it, there was, there was, there was a, a few things that could have been a robo jocks bad. Um, the dinosaur and a couple of things kind of just didn't fit right. Some of the sets didn't feel right. It, 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 they didn't spend hardly any budget on, on special effects. Um, the story was okay. Uh, girls, you know, being transported, you know, through time, kind of a quantum leap type thing because they do it more than once, uh, trying to solve the time paradox. They actually see and interact with their future selves, which was interesting. Um, but I mean, it was, it was all right, but man, the special effects were horrible. And I mean, really bad. I haven't seen stuff like that in a lot. It's that bad in a long time, especially with today's technology. Um, Character-wise, they were fine. You've got your standard, typical. There was one girl that you know, the badass one. That's the silent one. You know, they kind of went th that type of trope, um, type thing. So I mean, overall, I mean, it wasn't bad. <sighs> what I recommend it. I don't know if it's going to get another season, honestly. Uh, it's based off of a comic, but I don't know if it's going to get another season or not. Um, I don't know if it did well enough. Um, I think they're trying to capitalize on the whole um, Stranger Things phenomena right now. And so that's the reason why it, it, it kind of hits okay with people. But it wasn't bad. Um, characters were likable. The girls were likable. They were fun. There's a couple of, you know, tear-jerking, you know, emotional scenes in it. But overall, it was just, this one gets my, you know, two and a half, meh, take it or leave it type thing. Um, but it wasn't bad. Um, let's see. Uh, so one of the things I did watch, which I just watched it on a whim, um, because it was on HBO Max, and I was like, what the hell is this crap? And it's a cartoon, um, and I don't know how to pronounce the guy that wrote it and directed it and all the other stuff, but it's called Primal. Uh, Primal is a cartoon about a pretty much a caveman Neanderthal, um, that actually teams up with a T-Rex and they have adventures as a Neanderthal riding a T-Rex. <laughs> and there is not... A single bit of English spoken in this. Uh, I don't think you actually get a word, a, an actual understandable word, until like almost the end of season one, like the last episode of season one. Most of it's screaming, yelling, and grunts and groans. Um, it's it's pretty fucking good. Um, very violent. Very bloody, um, but it is really, really cool and really, really interesting. 
Um, they evoke a lot of emotions in their characters. Um, you you get the feels right at the beginning. I think this is something Kathy would really like too. She would probably find this show very very cool, especially the artwork in it. Um, and I watched season one. Season one was good. Um, season two started up and started watching it, and you know we get a new episode every week. Uh, and it's been really, really good. I'm really enjoying it. I was really shocked by it. You have to actually watch it. You can't just listen to it because, you know, there's no talking in it, <laughs> pretty much. Like I said, it's just a caveman grunting and yelling at everything that happens. Or, you know, being sad. But it's a lot of good facial expressions on all the the cast that they drew. So I highly recommend it. It was a ton of fun. Um, I can't wait to see what's going on with it. Um, other than that, um, I probably would give it so far a one because there's a couple episodes that are just kind of eh, okay. But I mean, overall, it's a ton of fun. Highly watch it. If you got HBO Max, go watch it. It's called Primal, uh, 30 minute cartoons type thing but very much um let's see i did watch a cartoon and this was also on hbo max uh called bell uh which is a story about people that are living in the virtual realm uh vr realm sort of like a, a sword art online um and uh there's like no role playing. It's just, you know, a virtual world like Second Life or whatever. And um, it was actually had some pretty good artwork. It was a pretty good story. Uh, it kind of follows the tone of Beauty and the Beast a bit. Um, but I highly enjoyed it. The artwork was really good. Story was OK. It was neat, and interesting. Nothing, you know, outrageous about it. But I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and it's only a movie, so, you know, you got a good hour and a half, you ain't got to worry about it. Um, and it's a good anime. Um, plenty of fun. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, recommend it. I would probably give it, like, one, maybe one and a half. Especially if you're not really that much into anime. But, it was worth it. Jim, I've been talking this whole time and didn't know if you had anything, but you told me you didn't, correct? Don't have anything for this week. Okay. Um, so my big one this week was, um, and the big talk of the town is Sandman came out on Netflix, uh, based on the comic book, uh, with, you know, of course, Neil Gaiman behind it. He didn't just, you know, let it go. He, you know, was working with it and everything, which was good. Uh, I love Neil Gaiman stuff. I uh, can't wait for, um, Good Omen season two to come out. Season one was amazing, but uh, Sandman is for me to know it's about a pretty much best way to describe it a god that gets captured by a human, and what happens after the fact. That's the best way to put it. Um, I will tell you that the actor they picked to play Dream was one hundred percent the perfect looking and acting person for this job. I've never seen a better casting than this man for this role. Um, Dream has a certain look and a certain style and for certain facial expressions. And it was 100% spot on. Um, I, I couldn't think of any other person that would be this good for this role um, type thing. Um, now I'm going to admit, I do not know a lot about the comic. I do know the comic. I've read a couple of the um, comics, but I'm not a huge, you know, hardcore fan, so I'm not going to say uh, anything on that. Um, I will tell you that this is a very, very good art piece. could be very confusing for people because it's a lot of characters, a lot of information, and a lot of stuff that can be thrown at you. Um, but the world building in this is fucking incredible um the characters are all amazing the world is amazing um I, I i just binge watched it all the way through i was like no fuck this this was this was really good um 
my favorite episode of all was uh, when Dream goes to hell and who uh, Lucifer is, uh, Morningstar and everything. It was like spot on. I was like this. That episode was my favorite episode. I could watch that episode again. It was so cool. Um, it it does take a little bit. There are a couple of episodes that are pretty rough uh, to to get through as an emotionally rough. Um, the full episode with death was pretty pretty emotional. Um, the I think it was the last episode or second to last episode was pretty like oh fucking a that's uh, that's bad, but it you know fit with the story and everything, um, and just kind of made your you know your your morals kind of clutch and everything. But it was so good, uh, well written. Uh, everybody acted really well in it. The special effects were great. Uh, the artistic flow and the way it follows the comic and the way everything looks is unbelievably amazing. Um, the special effects on this thing was just outrageous. Um, they, you can tell, yeah, Sandman Xander. Um, you can tell that they, this was lovingly cared for. Um, like I said, I don't know if it follows the comic 100%, uh, but I know that it definitely, you can tell that they cared for this show and put a lot of effort into making it good. Um, in the era of Netflix, Netflix ruining shows, um, and ruining IPs, they did not do that with this. Yeah. No spoilers, by the way. I'm not selling anything. But um, I enjoyed the shit out of this. It, it, it's I'm like, I may go watch it again because I liked it so much. And I hardly ever watch stuff again. Um, if I don't, you know, have a really good passion for it. Um, especially the art. And just the presentation, the costuming. Everything was just amazing to watch. Uh, very good feast for the eyes. Um, very good direction. I, I kind of want to know what Kathy thinks because her and I were kind of, you know, all in on that. And so whenever she gets a chance, you'll have to like nudge her for me, Jim, and go, hey, Gonzo watched it. What do you think? Um, type thing. Um, but I, I'm ready for season two. I want season two here now type thing. This just was like amazing. Uh, I know some people were kind of upset that uh, death was cast as a African American lady instead of, you know, a pale white woman, I guess you want to say. Uh, but I don't give a fuck. She did really good. Um, it was all really well. It was done amazing. Um, there were some pretty funny parts in here uh, with attitudes and everything. Um, but I, I enjoyed it like crazy. Zero, zero space or for me. Um, even on the episodes that felt like, I don't even say that it felt like filler, but they were building more story was still great beyond belief. I want more. Give me, give me, give me more. Um, but if you definitely like good set pieces, good artwork, good drama, good everything highly recommend Sandman um and my last one I forgot I did I didn't put this one down here but it, I did watch it uh was on Apple TV they had an animation by Skydance Studios or whatever oh I forgot two others I have two others so I can feel the last five minutes um they had an, a cartoon on there an anime animated movie called luck Luck is a story of a girl that has perpetual bad luck, never gets anything done right. Uh, everything's always having a problem with her. And uh, she finds a lucky penny, and she pretty much wants to give this lucky penny to her friend so she can get adopted, blah, blah, blah. And it just leads into complete chaos as she finds out that luck is actually something generated by... An outside entity and leprechauns and dragons and just the whole nine yards. Super, super cute cartoon. Uh, very much it could be, you know, you could let kids watch it. Nothing, you know, outrageous. No adulting, you know, type stuff. No major violence or anything. Uh, very fun. Very cute for kids. Um, 
highly recommend it. I give it probably a one because they were just like, but I, it's not geared towards me. I mean, it's you can see the plot a mile away. Uh, but kids will definitely 100% enjoy it um, type thing. So I, I recommend it, especially if you have kids. Um, my last one, because this one came out this week also, was Prey. Uh, Prey is the Hulu original movie um, about a predator that comes during... Um, uh, I can't remember what time frame, but American Indians are still roaming the plains and it's still the wild, you know, still the wild west type thing. I can't remember the time, so I forgot that. Um, but I mean, it it was interesting for the fact that uh, while this was an uh, American Indian, you know, trying to find trying to fight a predator. The Predator didn't have all the gadgets and gizmos that they have in the other movies because this technology wasn't created, you know, as far. So, you know, they didn't have as much power as it was in the previous movies, the first, you know, ones that we've seen. So the technology was pushed back a bit, which I thought was great because, you know, it's 300 years ago. You know, why would the Predator have the same technology that he has now in the original movies. So I thought that was a good way. Um, what I thought was amazing was they actually filmed the entire show in I think Cherokee. Um, so if you really wanted to get, you know, if you're really into it, you could watch the entire movie in Cherokee. And that was, uh, I was like, I'm not going to cause I'm not a subtitle person, but I thought that was very cool and very unique to do. Um, it was a lot of fun, uh, as a predator movie definitely fits in the genre. Uh, a lot of fun. A lot of cast was really good. Um, there was a lot going on. Very, very bloody. Um, it is a predator movie for <laughs> anybody that's kind of wondering, but it was, it was very good. Um, I give it probably a one cause there was a, a few slow scenes and you're kind of like get to the fucking monkey. But it wasn't bad. It was just like, come on, guys, we're here. We're here for the predator and you know American Indians and people with you know shitty technology trying to find a predator. But uh, it was it was it was good fun. Definitely a solid watch. Um, it ends pri- quite abruptly though, which I thought was very interesting. I was like, really? It was like, okay, yeah, yeah, and done. And I'm like, man, could have done a little bit more with that, but it was okay. Uh, like I said, I give it about a one because there are some stuff, you know, that just kind of, you know, kind of slow. But overall, it was pretty solid. Uh, I highly recommend it. If you have Hulu, go and watch it. It was a ton of fun. Um, Jim, are you sure you don't have anything? I It was one of those kind of <laughs> weeks. So there was, uh, outside of, uh, I'm trying to think if I actually saw anything. Uh yeah, I didn't even get to see the big reveal thing that happened at, what, 7 o'clock this morning that GW did with all of the Lord of the Rings stuff. That was like a live stream or something like that that they did. Uh, I, Well, let's see. How far? Well, we're still almost, uh, what, three weeks away, three and a half weeks, something like that, away from the first uh, episode of the Lord of the Rings show. There's just really nothing else that I can think of that i have seen unfortunately not this week who knows maybe maybe next week it'll be different i don't know what to say so other than that guys we appreciate you coming in um and listening and watching of course jim paint and then me talk about a bunch of movies but watching him do pretty much everything uh we will send you to Monster Den Minis, where they are doing some painting up and everything, so everybody can have some fun. So, everybody, we appreciate you being here. Um, look out next week. John and I will be back. Uh, we will probably have a different special guest. Let Jim have a little bit of a break and tend to things that he needs to tend to. And, uh, guys, for more than dice, I'm Gonzo. I might be Kathy someday. <laughs> Good night. <laughs>